The following presentation will use the Critical Appraisal Skills Program Checklist for Cohort Studies, CASP for short. CASP contains 12 questions to appraise study validity, trustworthiness of results, and value or relevance of cohort studies, and will be used to critically appraise the peer-reviewed journal article, long-term effect of mobile phone use on sleep quality, results from the cohort study of mobile phone use in health, COSMOS for short, written by Tadamanti et al, published in the Open Access Journal, Environmental International, volume 140 in July 2020. This article reports on the results from the prospective cohort study of mobile phone use in health, which is an international collaboration between the United Kingdom, Sweden, France, the Netherlands, Finland and Denmark. The purpose of COSMOS was to estimate how sleep outcomes were affected by an individual's exposure to radio frequency electromagnetic fields during mobile phone use. The article reports on data from the Swedish and Finnish populations of the study as the four-year follow-up period has been completed in those two countries. The researchers used a cohort study design, making CASP an appropriate critical appraisal tool due to ease of use in allowing the systematic evaluation of the evidence to assess the clinical meaningfulness of results and the internal and external validity of the study. It is important to evaluate the background literature used in studies to determine if a study is justified. The CAS tool does not provide a section to evaluate background literature, which is the limitation of the tool. For the purpose of this critical appraisal, we will provide a brief assessment of the background literature used in the study. The authors of this study reviewed literature of varying quality from meta-analyses to co cohort studies around the common theme of sleep and the confounding factors that affect a person's ability to sleep. There was a strong emphasis on electronic device use and how blue light and radio frequency electromagnetic fields emitted from devices affect sleep. Additionally, background literature also included how electronic devices were used, whether device addiction was a factor, as well as various studies investigating sleep disorders in general. The literature used was highly relevant and appropriate for the study as it contextualised the research question being asked. It also identifies possible confounding factors that may affect the results of the study. For the CASP checklist for cohort studies, question 1 through 6 appraises the validity of the study, with questions 1 and 2 serving as screening questions to determine if proceeding with the appraisal is appropriate. Question 1 is, did this study address a clearly focused issue? The study design used was a prospective cohort study of mobile phone use and health. This longitudinal study design has allowed the researchers to examine the effects of varying radio fr frequency electromagnetic field exposure across a wide range of health outcomes over a four-year period. Customers from mobile phone operators in Sweden and Finland between the ages of 18 and 65 were recruited. This study design is appropriate as there have been previous cross-sectional studies performed, however no or consistent associations have been found. Despite this, these studies lack statistical power and have short follow-up periods. Furthermore, the follow-up period is, regularly, is relatively regular at once per week, which allows for precise results in relation to exposure and development of symptoms, which is a strength of this study as well as verifying appropriateness. The third test for appropriateness questions if the outcome is too rare for the sample size. The sample size has been a limitation of previous studies and have prevented significant results, but with a sample size of almost 25,000, it will be strong enough to see significant results. A limitation of this study is due to not looking at reasons for mobile phone use or at what point during the day the phone is being used. An individual's phone use varies based on their line of work and the times they use their phone prior to bed, for example, and this will impact their sleeping patterns. Question 2 asks, was the cohort recruited in an acceptable way? Study participants for Tetamante 2020 were recruited from the 2010 study, Prospective Cohort Study of Mobile Phone Users and Health Design Considerations and Enrollment. Participants were from European countries, Denmark, Finland, Sweden, the Netherlands, and the UK, who will be followed for um, up to 25 plus years to explore the effects of mobile phone use. In Tessamanti 2020, mobile phone users were the target population. Mobile phone users in Sweden from 2008 and 2009, and Finland from 2009 and 2011, made up the actual population. Over 250,000 and 160,000 individuals from Sweden and Finland respectively were invited to participate in this study, making up the actual population. Of those, 50,736 and 13,070 participants filled in the baseline questionnaire and provided informed consent for access to mobile phone operator data. Stratified sampling by age and amount of mobile phone use was performed to oversample the younger, low-volume users 
and older heavy users and thereby increase the statistical power of the study. Participants outside the age range of 18 to 65 were excluded. People who didn't have operator data for mobile phone numbers listed in the baseline survey were excluded. Participants who had both filled the survey and the baseline survey and didn't often let others use their phones were included in the study. So this um, resulted in 21,049 participants from Sweden and 3,120 from Finland, making up a sample population of 24,169. Of those, 10,760 or 45% were men and 13,409 or 55% were women. For this study, we have concluded that the study addresses a clearly focused issue and the cohort was recruited in an acceptable way, meaning we can continue with the appraisal. Question three asks, was the exposure accurately measured to minimize bias? The exposure within the article is mobile telephone use amongst participants. The study does not prompt participants to use their phones in a certain way, but instead lets them use their phones as they would. Their mobile phone usage is tracked and measured through the deployment of questionnaires and objective traffic data from network operators. While this would usually not be an effective way to measure exposure, the study is able to do it effectively as it has a sample size of 250,000 and each call duration category has enough statistical representation to be able to draw substantial conclusions. The call duration time per week were divided into the following categories, less than five minutes, five minutes to 30 minutes, 30 minutes to an hour, an hour to three hours, three hours to five hours, and finally, greater than six hours. While the questionnaires were susceptible to recall bias, whereby participants may not reflect the true time they spent on their phones, the data from their network operators showed exactly how much time the participants spent on their phone during the week. With this in mind, the survey wisely used the network data to split participants into groups as opposed to questionnaires which were primarily used to measure health outcomes of the participants. If the questionnaires were to be used as the primary me measure of phone usage, the study would become susceptible to the participants not accurately reflecting how much time they'd spent on their phones. This could lead to people in the high ex with high exposure reporting themselves as low exposure. And if they showed poor health outcomes, it would appear like there is no correlation between mobile phone usage and health outcomes, when there in fact is. By using network data to measure data. The study has access to the participants' actual phone usage, and by doing so, the participants could accurately be divided into high and low exposure groups. Question four asks, was the outcome accurately measured to minimize bias? The outcomes measured in this cohort study include sleep disturbance, sleep adequacy, daytime somnolence, sleep latency, and insomnia. These outcomes were measured using a questionnaire based off a medical outcome study, MOS Sleep Questionnaire, where they were measured at baseline and at the full year follow-up. The MOS includes questions about each of the outcomes and the participants' answers were scored on a scale between 0 to 100. This scale is used to help define each of the outcomes for four weeks prior to this study. The questions were answered by using a modified MOS sleep disturbance scale where the sleep latency and daytime somnolence was not considered due to the mixing of information with similar outcomes and multiple reasons for day napping. The increase in these scores indicates an increase in poor quality sleep except for sleep latency. Some potential measurement bias found in the study was that the questionnaire did not take into consideration frequency and duration of the outcomes. This makes it difficult to determine how the outcomes had increased or decreased over the four year period. Question five comes in two parts. Part A is, have the authors identified all important confounding factors? The answer is no. The confounders which the author stated in the study include age, gender, country, sleep, outcomes at baseline, smoking status, alcohol consumption, body mass index, education level, consistent headaches, mental and physical health score, and diagnosis of depression. However, the author did not consider all potential confounders. Other confounders which were not taken into consideration were stress and anxiety, which can affect sleep and fatigue. Question 5 Part B asks, have they taken account of the confounding factors in the design and or analysis? 
The answer is yes. Model 1 was adjusted for only age, gender, country and sleep outcomes at baseline, whereas Model 2 was additionally adjusted for smoking status, alcohol consumption, body mass index, education level, consistent headaches, mental and physical health score and diagnosis of depression. Question 6 also comes in two parts. Part A, was the follow-up of subjects complete enough? Part B, was the follow-up of subjects long enough? Information about operator recorded mobile phone use and sleep outcomes was collected at baseline and at a four-year follow-up. Collection of exposure information and long-term follow-up of health outcomes will avoid biases inherent in cross-sectional designs. Sweden and Finland were the first two countries to complete the follow-up, and as more countries complete their follow-up, more data can be added to increase the generalizability of the study and reduce bias. Questions 7 through 9 assess the trustworthiness of results. Question 7, what are the results of the study? Question 8 asks, how precise are the results? And question 9 asks, do you believe the results? The results were analysed by Conbax Alpha Scale and Logistic and Linear Regression Models. Conbach Alpha Scale was used to help compare the internal consistency of both sleep disturbance and daytime somnolence with the original scale. Logistic and linear regression was used to analyse the effects of the operator recorded mobile phone use to different sleep outcomes. The results of the study found that there were no significant relationship between long-term phone use and sleep quality. While the results show that there was a decrease of 0.22 and 0.83 in sleep disturbance and sleep adequacy. In the group with the highest phone call average, these results were analysed and show that they were not statistically significant. This is due to the 95% confidence interval crossing zero. Therefore, it cannot be concluded that the mobile phone use is related to sleep disturbance and sleep adequacy. Additionally, sleep latency increased by 1.19, but it is also insignificant. The study suggests that the reason for these insignificant results is due to confounders, which may have affected the results of these outcomes. The author also suggests that there is no association between daytime somnolence and mobile phone call time, due to there being a 0.05 decrease at follow-up, therefore being too insignificant to see a difference. However, for insomnia, the group with the highest average of mobile phone call time has a 1.43 times the chance of having insomnia compared to the other groups. This means that there is some relationship between mobile phone use and insomnia. Overall, these results show there was no relation between long-term mobile phone use and quality of sleep. Questions 10 through 12 appraise the value of relevance of the research to the broader population. Question 10 asks, can the results be applied to the local population? Question 11, do the results of the study fit with other evidence? And question 12, what are the implications for this study? The conclusions made by the authors suggest that there was no association between phone call time and sleep disturbance when comparing the baseline to a four-year follow-up. In the highest decile of mobile phone call time, there was a moderate association with insomnia. Results showed that the lower the RF EMF exposure in universal mobile telecommunication service when compared to a global system for mobile communication suggests that sleep uh, quality was due to more than just RMEF uh, exposure. Researchers suggest it could be due to stress, high demands, problematic phone use, blue light filters as well as other factors mentioned by the authors. Some strengths of the study include the ease of access to participants operating data which allowed for long-term analysis of mobile phone use and sleep quality quantity to ensure significant results and reduce recall bias. Another strength is the use of a 12-item medical outcome study, sleep scale and insomnia indicator. The use of these questions allowed for a detailed and consistent recollection of sleep quality or insomnia symptoms. Furthermore, the study allowed for rare outcomes, such as those experiencing insomnia as well as sleep latency, to avoid excluding members of the sample. A limitation of the study was that it required individuals to estimate their sleep duration and time spent awake, for example. This caused recall bias as it is difficult to exactly recall sleep duration. Further studies could investigate which aspect of mobile phone use causes insomnia and the potential effect of blue light filters, for example. The CASP critical appraisal tool was selected as the initial two screening questions deemed the tool appropriate for the study type. The CASP proved to be a useful tool in evaluating the quality of the recruitment and results. 
It is a clear and concise tool that assesses and questions the validity of the results when compared to similar studies. It also assists in determining the study's ability to be applied locally. This is key when examining the effectiveness of implementing the study's findings in a clinical evidence-based practice.